with with dealing with your back pain and and trying to improve how you can move and, and be active and enjoy your life despite having that pain. Um, so I'm Dr. Lavelle. I work at, at Tennessee Orthopedic Clinics um, here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I've been in this practice now six years. Uh, prior to that, I was in Dallas, Texas for two years, uh, but I did all my training in Boston, Massachusetts, where I did my residency and fellowship. And my fellowship just was in, in spine medicine, trying to learn how to effectively treat back pain, neck pain. Um, and prior to that, I was in med school out in Chicago. So it's been, been a long journey, just learning, trying to get um, knowledgeable on this topic. Um, and through that path, I've really found that, as we'll see as we go through my slides, there's been various treatments and different ways to, to go about trying to help people with the symptom of back pain um, a lot, which is, you know, with mixed results. And what I've really found is that is that patients of mine and now over the last couple of years, what the literature really shows and all the research and different conferences I go to really shows that people that can that can really improve their lifestyle by by becoming more active and, and eating healthier foods have the most dramatic benefit and improvement in their back pain. Um, so we'll just kind of get moving here. Feel free to answer questions as you go. This is very informal. I know it's hard on a Zoom link to, to answer, to, to ask questions, but if you type something in, I'll, I'll get to them as we go or, or as we, when we start wrapping up. Um, so just a little history on back pain itself. It's, it's extremely common. I, I assume most people here today have, have experienced it in their life. Um, there's up to an 80% prevalence. Um, so that leaves us with 20% or so of people who never really get much significant pain in their back and, and they're the lucky ones. But majority of us at some point will experience back pain. It usually starts, typically starts to peak in our 30s. And then the prevalence of it as, as we get older just continues to increase. Uh, but the interesting part is as we get to about 65, 70, we start to see a decrease in that prevalence of back pain. So it seems to be right now that 40, 50 year olds and into our 60s when we see most of that, the, the symptoms of back pain. Um, a, lot, a lot of people come to me, they have this misconception, well, I must have done something. I had a, a trauma. They always want to tell me when the back pain happened and what caused it. And unfortunately, usually there isn't an incident that caused it. Maybe less than 4% of the time is, is there an actual injury or an activity that causes their back pain. Um, majority of the time, it's, it's getting out of bed. They start to feel an ache in their back and it starts going down the leg. Or they woke up in the middle of the night with a, a, a crick in their neck and it's just persisted and getting worse and now maybe going down the arm. So rarely is it due to, to a specific injury. Um, or, or they want to find some kind of damage that's being caused. They want to see, you know, there's, there's rarely a broken bone or, or some trauma within the tissue of the spine um, that's causing the injury. It's more just from age-related changes, as we'll see as we go through. Um, so on that similar aspect, um, usually it's not an activity that makes it worse. You know, people will go to a lot of different clinicians, different doctors, therapists will say, don't run don't lift, don't bend. Um, well, if you listen to all this advice soon, you'll just be sitting on the couch and you won't be moving. And that's definitely not living. And that's, and that's my goal is to get you functional and active and enjoying your life. Um, so that's how we got to take that approach to back pain. There's never been a study to show that running or as I, I mentioned here in the middle bullet point, bullet, bullet point um, that's been shown to be dangerous. It's, it's safe to do these things. Now, yes, sometimes they may exacerbate the pain, but it's it's not caused to worsen any injury or to cause any damage within the spine. And lastly, you know, it's rarely the physician that's going to cure you. You know, we've tried from injections to medications to surgery. I'm an osteopathic physician, so osteopathic manipulation. Rarely is that going to be the cure or what gets you better. More often going to be what you can do for yourself to get you over the hump. You know, there's a lot of things physicians can do to aid you in that process, but it's really going to be the patient taking charge and ownership of their, of their health that's going to get them better. Um, 
we'll keep going here. So this is just a little diagram of the spine to show you that that back pain is just a symptom. You know, we, we always think I, patients come in or, or doctors have diagnosed you with low back pain. That's, that's like saying I have chest pain. That's not what's causing it. So the, the most important thing that I can do for patients is kind of explain what's, what's going on and diagnose for you what the problem is. And sometimes it, it can be difficult to pinpoint it because it almost never is just one thing. It's usually a combination of the, as we see here, the discs, the bones, the nerves, the ligaments, the muscles, all are part of this spine. Um, and it all makes it up. So if you have weak muscles, you're going to get more pressure on the joints. If you have more pressure on the joints of the spine, like the facet joints, they're going to wear away a little sooner. You're going to get worsening of that arthritic change. Um, and vice versa, if you have a lot of arthritic change, it gets inflamed. That can irritate the nerves, which have a feedback to the muscles to cause them to be tight, tight and stiff and, and limit your mobility. So the everything and all the tissues within our spine from the inside out all interact with each other. Um, and not only that, when we focus on just the low back, we're missing the rest of the body. Our body's a unit. We're all one, one piece. So if you have treatment just for your back, for example, physical therapy or some type of exercises, and they're only touching your low back, well, the legs attached to the low back, the upper body, your arms all attached to the spinal musculature. It's all interconnected. So we have to focus on moving the whole body and getting your whole body flowing right to affect the muscle and tissue around even just the lumbar part of the spine. Um, so this, this is just showing you that there's a lot going on down there. It's more than if you come in with an MRI with a disc bulge, that's unlikely to be the only thing that's causing your symptoms of back pain. Um, and as we see here, as we get older, our spine just starts to degenerate. So it starts as early as you see that the dark dotted line there up top, as early as our teenage years, we start to get some arthritic, um, we start to get the symptom of back pain and it starts to peak into our 60s. And then as you see, when you get 65, 70, it starts to decline. But the solid black line is arthritis and that just continues to peak. And it, it really peaks in our 70s and 80s and that's universal. And that goes along not just arthritis, which is bony deterioration, but the discs in our spine, disc degeneration, which is disc bulges, disc herniations, disc protrusions, disc tears, all different words to describe the same process of disc degeneration that similarly follows that dark line. We only get older and that's like uni universal for everyone's going to develop this disc degeneration, this arthritis, but as that degeneration peaks in our 70s, the symptom of back pain start to decrease. So that means there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Just because you have degeneration in your spine or disc bulges or arthritic change does not mean you have to have pain. And as I said, even those people in that 20-25% that, that never have back pain in their life, they still have degeneration or disc bulges. So there's got to be more to the back pain than just the structure of our spine. Um, and I'll touch on that as, as we continue to go here. Like I said, if anyone has any questions, I know I'm kind of talking fast and throwing a lot of information at you. Um, feel free to, to, to ask a question and I'll, I'll stop at any time. Uh, but with this slide, just the takeaway is that we all get degeneration and arthritis in our back, but pain doesn't increase with that. Pain actually decreases as people continue to get arthritic change. Um, sorry, I skipped one there. Um, and this is just as what I was alluding to. We all get gray hairs and wrinkles. We're all just going to get older. Um, and that, that degeneration happens as, our, as we get those wrinkles, as we get those gray hairs. The same thing is happening in our body. Our, our joints are developing arthritic change. So you can get facet arthritis, which causes a lot of that pain across the low back. Our discs are going to degenerate. So as you get disc bulges, disc protrusions, that can cause not only back pain, but if it starts to irritate the nerve, that can cause pain down the leg. What you hear a lot of people talking about sciatica or pain down that leg, when you have a pinched nerve, it's called radiculopathy. That happens with that age-related changes. Um, but so too our muscles. Our muscles start to degenerate. So we go through a process called sarcopenia. As you lose those muscle fibers in your body, that's, that's what sarcopenia is. Those muscle fibers start to degenerate, so you lose muscle mass. 
So you have less muscles supporting your spine and those structures rely on those muscles. I say a lot in my, my practice to, to stabilize the spine like, like wires on a telephone pole. You need those muscles in your back, but throughout your whole body to allow your spine to stand up straight and be in a good neutral position that takes pressure off those degenerative areas. So we have a lot working against us as, as we age, the degeneration in our spine, the loss of muscle mass. But again, as that last slide showed, that doesn't mean you have to have continued pain or loss of functioning quality of life. Um, so, so as we get all these things happen to us, I know I'm not painting the most rosy of pictures, um, but as our body starts to degenerate and we develop, if people develop back pain, um, many things have been done. As you see here from the 90s to the mid to 2010s and, and onward, these trends have just continued. There's been 100 to 200% increases in pain medication use, narcotics, opioids, but also NSAID use, spinal injections, spinal surgeries, all these things dramatically increasing the use of them to treat this, this, these back pain symptoms. However, people still get that back pain. The, these, the disability rates are still, still rising. The complaints and loss of function from back pain is still increasing, but yet all these treatments have dramatically increased with it. So clearly they haven't had the benefit and effect that we had hoped we would see. Um, so instead of continuing on this path where we use um, kind of mainstream medicine, if you will, or relying on physicians to provide a service like a magic pill or magic injections, or well, if those don't work, definitely surgery will help me. Um, instead of continuing down this path, maybe there's another direction we need to start thinking about, about taking. And, that, and that's where I, this kind of talk comes into um, really what I wanna speak about, which is, is kind of try, us trying to take control of our own symptoms and, and getting moving despite some of the pain. And, and that's very hard to do is, is when you're in discomfort, whether it's the neck or back is, is starting to exercise or even just starting to be more active um, and work through that pain is, is really what we've seen provide good relief for patients. And I just list a couple studies here. I won't go through everything in detail as you guys can read it. Um, but it, we, we've been able to show and through various studies over the last five or so years that, that people that remain active through the pain um, or use activity and movement to treat their back pain um, have the, mo the greatest amount of success. Um, there's been some good studies that show when we, when we compare people that have taken medications to had spinal injections to spinal surgery, when we look at them two to three years out, the, the group that universally wins is the exercise group. They've always pre pre uh, performed better when we look at functional scores um, through assessing them through functional questionnaires or disability questionnaires. They have the best ratings compared to the other groups when we look at them long term. Now, in the short term, yes, injections can be helpful. Even surgery at, at times can be helpful. But when we look at people's quality of life long term, those that stick with a, a more consistent exercise program and, and movement pattern um, have the greatest success and, and, and best outcomes in terms of their level of pain, but also their quality of life and day to day functioning. Again, this is just a, another little list of some research talking about the, the benefits of those exercise. And this first one here is important with improvement of flexibility, strength, and endurance activities. Um, so when we're, we're trying to do our day-to-day -day activities, we have to move through our normal range of motion. We have, to, we have to keep moving and that's where flexibility is so important. Your overall mobility so you can bend to the floor and pick up your your child or grandchildren or get things out of the dishwasher um, or, or lifting overhead so you can get things out of the closet um, and strength being able to pick yourself up off the, off the chair or off the floor or get up off the toilet that's where this flexibility and strength comes in so maintaining those those benefits through exercise is going to be so important um, and it will, if you maintain that strength and flexibility, also improve your back pain, as we see with that bullet point here, number two, up to 54% reduction in back pain. That's pretty dramatic, and, and that equals any short-term benefit you could get from injections, typically, or medications, um, but it's just through what you can do on your own to, to improve it up 
pretty dramatic improvement with 54% with decrease um, just through exercise. And, and then similarly, as, as we move on from that, and I'm gonna go back to exercise in a minute, um, but the other side of the coin is, is nutrition. And so this study here was just a, a review study looking at multiple different, different studies, which was just done in 2019. And this looked at more plant-based diet. And what we want to kind of focus on, it doesn't, plant-based diet means eating mostly fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, um, and avoiding a lot of animal products. Um, it doesn't mean not having them all together, but when you look at the food you eat, trying to have, you know, 80 or 90% of your, your plate be plant-based. So if you can raise it um, on a farm or you get it on the outside of the, the grocery store around the outside of the aisles where, where things are more naturally produced, um, that's gonna significantly decrease your inf inflammation in your body. Um, foods that are made in a factory have a lot of a processed or a processed foods um, have a lot of pro-inflammatory markers in them because they have to keep they have to keep on the store shelves for a long time. So they have to have a lot of preservatives, which our body doesn't digest well and cause a little a lot of inflammation in our our gut, our GI tract, which then gets into our body systemically and causes a lot of inflammation. And that inflammation is a key to increasing pain. Um, Similarly, a lot of products that you'll buy that are processed have a lot of food dyes in them. And a lot of countries have banned food coloring or food dyes um, because they increase the risk of cancer and cancer develops because of inflammation. Um, so if we work on avoiding these foods that cause inflammation, but eating more foods that decrease inflammation or have a product called, or that have, or have more antioxidants in them, antioxidants are what counter inflammation. So by decreasing inflammation, you're gonna improve that degenerative process. So you're gonna have less degeneration in the spine. Um, so it will help with pain and swelling as the second bullet mentions. If you have less inflammation and eat a healthier diet, you're gonna be able to feel and move better and eating good quality foods, your body digests it better. That's gonna help your metabolic rate, which will lower your overall um, body mass index. Um, and as I mentioned, you'll, you'll have healthier gut flora or good, good bacteria that your body also needs to produce those antioxidants to help combat inflammation. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be eating all plants, but mostly you know, healthy, whole natural foods is what you really wanna focus on eating because that will decrease that inflammatory response in your body. Um, but it will also, give you the other side, which will be more antioxidants, which can combat inflammation. So it can decrease cancer. It can decrease that de normal age-related degeneration that we see in our spine. So people that eat healthier, maybe have less disc degeneration, maybe have less arthritic change. Um, but definitely, even though you will still get it, it may slow that rate of degeneration and along the way, slow the amount of pain you have with that. Um, so I always like to say is if, if we're moving well and, and we're eating, you know, whole natural foods, foods that you can get from a farm and, and raise on your own or that have been raised and, and brought to the grocery store, that's really the, the way to go to help your body in, in many aspects of your health, but specifically to help combat your back pain. Um, so this is just a little summary of what I said, the types of foods. Like I said, if, if, if it can be, be, be grown on, on your own or from a farm, that's what you should kind of focus on eating. And if you know it was it produced in a factory, probably good to stay away from that as, as best you can. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but trying to make those choices when you going into the, the pantry instead of grabbing the bag of chips or the Oreos, maybe grabbing the bag of nuts and, and a water um, for that snack. It's, it's slowly making those changes and, and you'll feel the benefit um, pretty quickly. Um, and this is this will all be emailed out to you, but just focus on the bottom two lines, kind of the things you want to think of, of eating. Um, fruits and vegetables is pretty much the takeaway there. Um, and then lastly, a, a recent study came out, and well, it's not as recent now, I guess it was 2018, um, but people who follow these five habits can increase their life expectancy up to 10 years. And if that's not the, the most powerful thing I can say today, 
um, I don't know what would be. Um, that's pretty dramatic. If you can add 10 years to your life by eating nutritious foods, exercising regularly, which in turn will help you keep a healthy body weight, and then also avoiding putting in toxins into your body, such as excessive alcohol or smoking. Um, those five things can, can dramatically improve your life. And what's interesting about that is not only will you add 10 years to your life, but it'll be of much higher quality. So you'll be 80 years old and instead of having trouble, you know, moving around or, 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 or getting from place to, to place, you'll be able to do that a lot easier because if you're exercising, your muscles will still be strong. You won't have as much degeneration. If you're eating healthy foods, you'll be having more antioxidants to combat that inflammation. So you won't get a lot of the, the chronic diseases we see today, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or if you have those and eat a more plant-based diet, they're curable. And, and that's, that's, and I mean curable. Um, you don't have, for most types of diabetes, type two diabetes, that is, um, you can reverse the, 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 those effects in the, that diabetes, those elevated blood sugars through eating a more plant-based diet. Similar with cardiovascular disease, um, you can reverse those, that vascular um, injury by eating more healthy foods and increasing those antioxidants and decreasing the inflammation. So, so lots of ways to improve your health um, over and above just treating your back pain. Um, I'll pause there for a sec to see if, if anyone has any questions or anything, or I can, I can continue moving on. Um, hopefully that, that all makes sense so far. Um, but what I was going to do at this point is just kind of talk about a, a, a typical scenario of, of patients I see. Is a, a Hi, lot Dr. Of... Lavelle. Yes. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, there was a message that came through, but it just came to me. I'm going to copy it and put it where you can see it. And it is from Susan, but it'll look like it's from me in the chat box. I want to get that uh, question yeah. to you. Great. So I'll read this. It says, how do, how do you increase muscle strengthening for a 77 year old who is losing muscle mass? Can knee replacement decrease back pain? Does massage help back pain? What exercises work? So good question. So I have a lot of my patients that are 70s, 80s. Probably the, the oldest one I can think of was, was 92 that I, I saw about a year ago. And, and different ways to increase um, muscle strengthening. Um, but the good thing is it's never too late to start. Um, and it's, it's pretty simple. There's no magic exercise. Um, there's no magic way, you know, 10 magic exercises. That's, you know, you'll see it in a lot of magazine, do these five things and, and, and you'll be cured of your back pain. It just doesn't work. That's kind of like goes back to the slide is have this magic spinal injection and you'll do great. The key is movement quality. So as, as our muscles start to weaken and our muscles then, when you have mu less muscle mass from that process of sarcopenia I mentioned, you get less, less muscle fibers, which equals less muscle mass. Those muscles have to work harder. So they're easier to strain. They're also shorter, so they're tighter. So you have less mobility. So we really have to work on the quality of movements. And that's the case if you're 77 or 22. A lot of people come in, they've been exercising for 10 years and say, well, my doc, my doc, I exercise. I go to the gym all the time. But if you're exercising and never been trained how to exercise with the proper movement quality or never been coached with the right people to teach you how to exercise, you may be exercising, but you may be constantly straining those muscles because you're not exercising with a good spine and neutral position or leaning to one side. Or if your, your legs are off or you're have some asymmetry in, in how your muscles are firing, you can keep straining that area. So it's so important to work with someone who can develop a good exercise program specifically for you. You don't want some cookie cutter approach going to, you know, some clinic that says do these 10 exercises for bone health, muscle health, or, or quality of life. It really needs to be individualized. And I often relate it to people that play a sport. You know, no one just gets on the ice and starts playing hockey or, or starts shooting a basketball perfectly. Yes, some people are, are better at that than others, but everyone has to be coached. And there's no different with exercise. You, you really need to work with someone knowledgeable about how muscles move, how muscles fire, and, and specifically how that works in you as that individual and how them help you put that all together to get you stronger and moving better. Um, 
but I can think of many patients in their 70s, 80s, and early 90s that I've sent um, to different trainers here in Knoxville um, that really work with them to help improve that how they're moving and you start slow you know it may just be they're they're in a wheelchair and, and rarely are getting up so it's practicing sitting standing up from a sitting position and then slowly you progress or or just stepping up onto a stool to mimic stepping upstairs so they can get up and down their stairs again but it's a very kind of stepwise approach but it has to be stepwise so you don't want to just be doing the same exercise because we just plateau it has to be incrementing and challenging what you do um, you know, really a good saying I like is you want to do, you know, functional movements. So movements that mimic your day-to-day -day activities, that's how you're going to get stronger. So things that mimic getting up out of a chair, like a squat or things that mimic bending over at your waist to get things out of the dishwasher, a, a deadlift type activity, or things that mimic an overhead press to put things up in the cabinet. Um, so those types of functional movements but not just doing the same ones, constantly varying them. So not every day doing that same set of routine, but varying up how you do that press um, or whether it's with dumbbells or resistance bands or body weights or a can of soup. Um, so varying the type of exercise you do and then also with some intensity. So you don't want people say, well, I go for a walk every day, but that walk is with their cup of coffee in hand. So you're not really straining or trying to improve that muscle strength. It has to be kind of at a, a moderate to high intensity and whatever that is for that individual patient, that's different for everyone. But you wanna challenge those muscles and which in turn will challenge the nervous system to help decrease pain. Um, so a very long-winded answer. Um, you also asked in there if, if a knee replacement can help back pain. And that, that's exactly, absolutely. If, if the knee is so arthritic that it's hard for you to move or it's causing you to have you know, an altered gait that can throw, up, throw off how your, how your pelvis is moving and how your, your back is, is moving. So that'll throw off those muscles, um, putting pressure on that low back in those degenerative areas. Um, so sometimes getting a knee replacement um, can help that overall movement quality. And that's really what it comes down to is we got to make sure we're moving with good quality activities or good quality movement um, and then building upon that. Um, so yes, we can, we can definitely, if you, if you want to reach out to us, we can, or um, Sloan, you just asked another question. Can you recommend some good trainers? I can definitely recommend um, some to you in, in town and we can get that information to you for sure. Anyone else have any other questions? We have a couple more minutes left. And I, I think the biggest thing to think about when, when you have back pain is, is one, back pain is a symptom. Um, so you never wanna leave a doctor's office saying, well, I, I, I was diagnosed with, with low back pain. That really doesn't cut it. It's, it's what's causing that back pain. You need to get to that root cause of, 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 of the primary source of, of what is going on um, with that low back to cause the pain. Um, and then how do you appropriately fix it? Sometimes injections can help. They're temporary. They're not going to be a cure. They may help quiet down the pain. And the goal should be that they quiet down the pain so you can get moving. It all should be a focus on function, not pain. Yes, you, you, we want to decrease your pain as much as possible, and that will happen. Um, but really, the end game should be, am I enjoying myself? Can I go outside and play with my kids, my grandkids? Can I, can I, can I have fun? Can I get back to playing the sport I love? Um, those are what should be the focus. We don't want to let pain drive us. Pain is that symptom that can overcome our lives. And it's trying to break out of that idea that pain, I have to let pain guide me. Well, let's guide the treatment ourselves and, and take control and let function guide us. How do I get functional again? How do I get moving and doing the things I wanna do? Um, and so finding the cause of, of what's the cause of that pain and then finding a treatment path that's gonna allow you to function maybe despite having some pain. You know, we also have to realize sometimes we may still have some of that pain there, but what can we do functionally despite that and make sure we're able to, to get the most of our life, especially if we're gonna do these healthy lifestyle habits and, and live an extra 10 years, we want those to be 10 good years. Um, another question uh, came in here. Let me just get back up to it. Uh, 
Bear with me here a sec. Um, what do you suggest for minor pain in the low back, ice, heat, et cetera? How long should you self-treat before seeking help? Very, very, very good question. So a lot of people would say never use heat, use ice, um, because that'll decrease inflammation. The problem is typically the inflammation that's, if there is inflammation in your back, it's so deep down that ice isn't going to penetrate far enough. So I always say, do what feels good, whether it's ice or heat. Um, so typically it's heat that will help because heat's going to help loosen up some of the musculature, especially if you do some stretching um, with a heating pad on, or ideally if you could get access to a sauna or the, a step down from that would be kind of a hot tub because that'll penetrate deeper heat. There's been a lot of good evidence of people that sauna more regularly um, have improvement in their overall muscle flexibility, not only the muscles, but the ligaments. Um, so sauna can be a very good way to get good heat to help loosen up and, and, and have those back or any muscles more flexible. Um, but typical back pain, if it's an acute back pain, will get better in about two to six weeks. So if it's tolerable, the best thing you can do is try to stay as active as you can. Um, bed rest is definitely not recommended. Um, but sometimes it's so severe, it's 10 out of 10 pain, it's hard to move and that's okay, just do the best you can. Um, but if it's been two, three weeks and it's not improving on its own and you've tried ice or heat or if you can tolerate anti-inflammatories or Tylenol and you've tried to stay active as you can, that's when it might be worth uh, being seen to make sure it is nothing harmful or there's nothing bad going on. Um, but as you know, typically it's two to three percent of the time that is there, there is there anything bad that's underlying. Uh, meaning those kind of things we physicians look for, those red flags. Is it an infection? Is it cancer? Is it you know, caught equina syndrome where the nerves are being pinched and no longer firing appropriately causing damage? Um, so those things are definitely things we want to rule out first. But if those are ruled out, that's when we can uh, progress down the path I've discussed today. And, and that's the case for 95, 96% of people. It is safe to get moving again. And that's going to be the best long-term treatment. Another message came through here. What are the best exercises for upper back pain? Um, good question. So the best initial exercise is just exercise in general. Is because That's what most people aren't doing or fearful of doing. Um, and, that, and that fear avoidance is a big controlling factor here. And we want to be, be sure we, what I'm trying to encourage you is that movement and good quality movements are the key. Um, because we don't have to be fearful as long as anything bad has been ruled out initially. Um, but there is no magic exercise for the upper back. You know, there's a, a good app I can tell you for mobility called Down Dog Yoga. It's an app you can get on an app store. I think there's a minimal fee for it, but usually there's a, a, a free period there. Um, so it's called Down Dog and there's a program in there called Yin, Y-I-N Yoga. And I really like Yin Yoga for flexibility and mobility. And it's something you can get on a lot of different apps um, or online, different stretches. But specifically for the upper back, a lot of us are working at a computer or they're bent forward with their neck forward, their shoulders rolled forward and kind of hunched forward, almost like a cashew. So we need to reverse that. So opening up your chest, opening up your shoulders and strengthening your back or what we call the paraspinal or posterior chain muscles um, is what many people have deconditioning of because everything in our society nowadays is looking down. It's looking down on your phone, in a book, on a computer or playing video games. We see it as early as our teenage years and into the twenties, people are getting their muscles so deconditioned in their back of their upper back and neck that they're starting to get bony spurs off the back of their head. Um, where those muscles have become so tight and pulling on the bone because we're all forward like this. So we need to open up stretching the pec muscles um, and opening up the chest and shoulders and being more upright. And to do that by strengthening your upper back muscles, that's going to pull you back. So things like row, a rowing machine can be good or pull downs can be good or, or back extension type exercises. Um, but remember what I said initially is you don't want to do something just for a specific area because our body's all a unit. We're all connected. So you also got to treat your core, your abs, your pelvic and leg muscles to help bring your back up straighter. That will help the upper back because those back muscles go up the whole entire spine and attach down to the pelvis. 
So even for the upper back, you want to be doing squats, lunges, these kind of functional movements I described that will help stabilize that whole spine. Um, so again, that's why it's good usually to, to see someone specifically to help you, you know, develop a good, a good exercise routine. Okay, I think that's all the questions in the chat box for now. Um, Dr. Lavelle has patients this afternoon, so we're going to wrap it up for the day. Um, I, this presentation has been recorded, so I will email it out to everyone who signed up for this talk. Um, I put in the chat box as well three different ways you can schedule with Dr. Lavelle. You can call us, 865-690-4861. Um, or you can visit us at talkdocs.com or send us an email to feedback at talkdocs.com. Um, and I will send this all out in email to you as well. Um, sorry, I'm seeing all the thank yous come in on the chat box now. Um, I'm like, I need to sit up straight after listening to Dr. Lavelle. <laughs> um, but if you have any questions or want to schedule or have another topic that you would like to hear a TOC physician talk on, please just send us an email and we would love to hear um, the feedback from you guys. So thank you so much and y'all have a great rest of the day. Thank you all for listening. Hope you have a great day.